Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and that you're fully energized for this new panel. It is a topic close to the heart of many, especially us in Fox, the Association of All Conservative Students, whose organization I am fortunate enough to be the president of. The very raison d'etre of Fox has been to fight against political correctness and to guard academic freedom in our country. And the motivation behind this fight and is the vision of the academia as a place of honest and cordial debates, where people, through the art of the dialect dialectic, can pursue truth. And as one famous man once said, the truth shall set you free. To discuss this important subject, I am pleased to be joined by Frank Freddy from MCC Brussels. Sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, Emma Webb from Common Sense Society. Ilmari Rostila from the Finnish Association and the Norwegian historian Stirla Allingsvork. And I ask the panelists to come up. All right, and then it's uh, Frank Freddy who will open up for us. Uh, thanks very much. This, is, uh, this session is usually called where I come from the graveyard shift after lunch when <laughs> people ate a little bit too much. So my job is to make sure that uh, you, do, you don't get completely sleepy and bored. Uh, and hopefully I, we can have a very stimulating panel I'm really glad to be here in Finland because I have a special uh, emotional connection with Finland. I always remember in, when I was a child, nine years old, in the Hungarian Revolution, um, when the Russians came in and smashed it, my father was trying to reassure me by telling me stories about the Winter War in Finland. And he was telling me that if these little Finns can actually fight so bravely, then there's a future for us here in Eastern Europe. And I always remember uh, being inspired by the way that the Finns, the small nation, has really managed to get its act together and demonstrate to the whole world that freedom isn't just another word, but it's something really, really, truly significant. You know, I'm here to talk about academic freedom, but it's important to realize that academic freedom and freedom in general do not live in two separate worlds. If we don't take freedom seriously in our everyday life, if you think that freedom is something that is guaranteed for you by a piece of paper, then you're in trouble. Because freedom is not something you can ever take for granted. Freedom is not a gift that you can put in your pocket or you can put in your bedroom uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, closet and hope that it will still be there. Freedom is something that you've got to live. And that's true for society. It's something conservatives have been very complacent about. Uh, but it's also true for the university and for academic life in general. One of the problems that we have in academic life is that you, you never meet anybody in the world who says, I'm against academic freedom. You just don't, nobody says, oh, Frank, I really hate academic freedom. <laughs> right? They don't say that. Well, the one thing that they all say and this is the real giveaway. We'd always say, you know, Frank, I believe in academic freedom, but... And it's what comes after the but that is really important. Because by qualifying academic freedom and saying that it's not something that is a good in and of itself, what you're doing is you're, is you're reducing freedom, academic freedom, to a second-order principle. Not a first-order principle, which is what it should be, but a second order principle. So these days, uh, when I, 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 mean, I, I wrote a book on the universities, what happened to the university, 
and I did a book tour in the United States and different parts of Europe. And when I finished speaking, somebody would usually say, yeah, you're right, Frank, I believe in academic freedom, but, and the but could be things like, you know, um, academic freedom is okay as long as academics are aware of their privilege. I'm sure that hasn't come to the Nordic world yet, this thing that somehow we got this privilege and therefore we should watch out. Basically what they're really ma saying is just because you got a PhD and you're a professor and you publish 20, 25 books, doesn't give you the right to just lecture and imagine that's the way it should be because somebody that just come off you know, s from school, you know, who can barely tie their shoelaces, has just as much uh, right to tell you uh, to say something different or not to listen to you. Or they will say, I believe in academic freedom, but you know, students are very sensitive. Students are so sensitive that they cannot really uh, deal with what we call in, in, in the Anglo-American world, it's a California expression, controversial ideas. Now, it's a funny, funny concept. When I was young, a controversial idea was a, an exciting idea. I mean, it's the very opposite to a boring idea, you know? But these days, controversial ideas are pathologized. And in many universities, mission statement, they say, if you're going to be giving controversial ideas, then you better check your privilege, right? Or, you b or you bet if you're going to say something controversial, you should think about the sensitivities of our children. Or, sorry, I, I, that's my word, of our students. <laughs> so this is true. You know, I'm, what, eight years, ten years ago, I, I was inspected. We got this silly system of inspection in English universities. And this guy comes in to inspect me in my seminar. I look at the guy, I just know this is weird because he looks like a loser, right? <laughs> I mean, I know, I know this sounds. So anyways, I, I do my seminar and I'm really proud. I think it's a great seminar. Everybody's talking. There's a buzz and everything else. So I, I asked the guy, uh, what do you think of the seminar? And he says, I'm not so sure. And I say, why aren't you so sure? Because I think you're an academic bully. So I was, I was a bit taken aback. But then I learned what the definition of an academic bully is. An academic bully is somebody like me who uses the platonic method of teaching. That's to say, when I, I'm in a seminar, I say, Emma, what do you think of this? And you give the answer. And then I say, oh yeah, well, why do you think that? And I sometimes ask the same student five or six questions to try to get at the truth or at, 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 at an approximation of the truth as much as possible. And that is an honorable teaching me method that we've been using since the Aristotelian era. And I think it works quite well. I discovered that's being an academic bully. And the logic of that is that it's wrong to put pressure on students. I don't know you got this in the Nordic countries, but if you put pressure, which is the most creative thing that you can possibly do to give them intellectual independence, then you're a, an academic bully. So you've got to be sensitive to students. And then finally, I believe in academic freedom, but it's got to be subordinate to equity. That is to say to uh, uh, inclusion, to make sure that everybody feels included in it. Now inclusion is m probably my number one hate word. I mean, I really hate, it. every time I hear the word inclusion, I feel like I gotta go to the bathroom really fast, <laughs> right? I feel like it's kind of, so, so when I was teaching in Britain, inclusion meant, um, you know, opening up the universities to any, anybody that moved, right? A as long as you could get up in the morning and brush your teeth, yeah, you're in the university. That's, that's really good. And, and then uh, I kind of looked at the concept and you realized but inclusion means, yes, you're included, but because everybody's included, the meaning of higher education changes. If you don't have to, when I was a student, I had to struggle to get into the university. I had to work very, very hard, and many of my friends never got into the university. Bec uh, and that meant something, because when you got there, you knew this was really a, an important, intense experience. But now, if coming into university is like an extension of high school, Anybody can do it. What you're included into is not what a university is. Yes, there is inclusion, 
but what you're included to is no longer higher education. It's an industrialized version of what education is all about. The beauty of education is entirely annihilated and destroyed in the whole process. See, the thing that I'm really getting at, because these thing, two things are connected, is that if you do not take education seriously, if you do not understand that education is a value in and of itself, then you are going to be quite casual about freedom. Right? If you don't think ideas are really important, then academic freedom is, oh, it's cool, but you know, not that cool. You know, there's other things to kind of worry about. And I think very much is the case that uh, in higher education, the academic life, truth and the quest for truth and the integrity of the educational process is no longer seen as that important. It becomes continually subordinated itself. So education has become a second order principle. Now, having listened this morning, I just changed my speech. Because one of the things that I'm really concerned about is this. Education should be something that conservatives should monopolize. I mean, as Hannah Arendt, one of my favorite political philosophers, said, education is principally about conserving. Education is principally about transmitting the historical legacy of our culture and civilization. That's what education is really all about. And on top of that, then we build uh, dimensions of intellectual experience that yield to new experience. And it's this dynamic between conserving and at the same time being open to new experience that is really what education should be all about. And that, to me, means that it should be conservatives who are dominating higher education, the universities. But where is that happening? Yeah, where is that happening? Conservatives gave up education a long, long, long time ago. I remember about 20 years ago, I was in Washington. I gave my little lecture to the American Enterprise Institute, and these guys come up to me, these American guys, and they say, you know, Frank, I don't understand. Why are you wasting your time in a university? And I said, actually, I, I love academic life. I love my research, and I love teaching. He says, you know, it's much easier here in this think tank Right? Nobody gives you a hard time in the American Enterprise Institute. And basically what he was really saying is that people like me should evacuate the universities, hand it over to the other side, and we can all hang out in the boardroom of the American Enterprise Institute. <laughs> that's, what that's what he's really kind of saying. And of course I can understand because uh, under those circumstances, the pressure, the burden of standing up for your ideals and being accountable and responsible for ideals is relieved because you're talking to people just like yourselves. I was in America a year before COVID breaks out. And again, all these American conservatives are saying, oh, it's terrible what's happening in the schools. It's really bad what's going on in the schools. And I say, yeah, it is not good. But then I say, well, how many of you would like to have your children becoming a teacher? Yeah, how many of you will tell your kids when you go to university, it's a really honorable occupation to becoming a teacher? Because that's not what you say. You say uh, banking, in going to finance, going into business, making a lot of money. And when you look at it, if conservatives don't send their children to become teachers, or if they themselves don't become teachers, then don't be surprised. Don't be surprised that the young people in schools and in the universities will be monopolized by the anti-intellectual, anti-educational, and most importantly, the anti-civilizational ideals that are in circulation. So I say it's partially our fault that what has happened. You, it's very easy to blame wokeism. It's very easy to blame the other side, but look to ourselves and ask the question, what have we done to make sure that the ideals of uh, proper, you know, sort of uh, kind of Judeo-Christian Judeo educational norms are maintained and fought for in every, in every single day. There are, <laughs> there are two enemies we face in higher education, and especially those of us that want to stand up for education. The first one I'm not going to talk about, because you all know they're the woke adversaries, the countercultural people, who basically want to destroy Western civilization 
and detach us from our organic relationship to where we've come from. I think you all know that, or you should know that, otherwise you shouldn't be here. But the second enemy, which is equally important and is very rarely recognized, potentially even more dangerous, is not the uh, loud, woke people going on about LGBTQ plus identity. It's the technocratic uh, sort of social engineering, progressivist pressure on universities. You know, since the 20th century, people who run big business, people who run the technocracy are saying, you know, higher education is a bit of a luxury. I mean, why teach classics? You know, what's the point of classics? You know, you're not going to get a job. You're not going to get a job because you speak Latin or you learn ancient Greek or you understand the old civilizational philosophies. Let's, let's change from classics to what they call skills, employability skills. And basically what they've done is they impose these technocratic values on universities. They've industrialized universities to the point at which the purpose of a, a university education is to get a piece of paper at the end and get a piece of paper that will get you a job. And the tragedy is, is that this has had such an impact on academics that they've internalized it. I go to Oxford University, not a bad university internationally. I talk to people in the classics department and I, I say, well, how, how are you coping? You know, is anybody still coming to learn Latin or Greek? And they tell me, well, you know, Frank, what we're doing now is we're telling our students or potential students that you've got to learn classics because if you learn classics, that will give you the linguistic and, uh, and, and, and kind of media-related skills that will get you a job in banking. <laughs> so if you look at the Oxford University's classic department, how they sell themselves, they don't say it will give you a love of ancient Athens, a love of Athenian philosophy, they don't say all the obvious things. It's because it's good for getting a job in, in the city. Right? Weird. But that's really uh, what has become o overall when we, when we think of these things. So this idea is really quite important. And I think one of the things that has happened is because of this kind of pressure from uh, the technocratic social engineering element is the meaning of education has changed quite fundamentally. In the old days, and when I say old days, I'm talking about when I was young, you know, uh, sort of in the old days, pedagogy was motivated by two disciplines, theology and philosophy. Theology and philosophy were the ones that were driving our educational pedagogic uh, ideals. That's really how it was, was founded. Sometime in the 20th century, theology and philosophy was displaced by psychology. So if you, if you become a teacher these days, if you learn pedagogy, if you become a pedagogue in the university, what you're doing is using psychology and psychological tricks as a way of communicating your discipline. And that's a big problem, because once psychology becomes the medium for educating people, then the inherent positive qualities of education are exhausted and become undermined. And that's why you have a situation today when very often with skills and with psychology, students are encouraged to regard themselves in a very different way. If psychology becomes integrated into higher education, then your definition of a student alters. And students then become vulnerable, they become infantilized, they essentially become increasingly seen, not as strong men and women, but as patients. They're no longer people that you can offend. You know, if I have strong words, I'm being offensive and that's not allowed because offending a student is like a cultural crime. We've invented this concept. I hope it hasn't come to Finland yet. A concept of a safe space. The idea that somehow you need to have this safe space. Uh, the assumption being that outside of this safe space, it's unsafe, right? I remember when, s when it began, a uh, uh, safe space was a room. Then it became a whole floor of university. Now it's the whole university. And over the last four years, it's migrated into public institutions. 
the safe space already, the fact that somehow, if you have criticism and questioning, that is inherently unsafe. The worst thing, uh, something that shocked me, I'm very cynical, and I've been through a lot, so I don't get surprised, but I did get surprised by one very small thing that happened a month ago. I was talking to the librarian of my university, and I asked them, why is it that some of these books are not there anymore? And she says to me, because they're old. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I, I s at that point, I swore. I, I swear quite a lot, but I'm not going to do it now. And I said, for sake, <laughs> how about the Bible? Right? I mean, that is as old as it gets. You know, what are you going to do with that? And essentially, what they're doing in, in universities everywhere in England, also in the United States, is they think that an old book is automatically inferior to a new book. How stupid is that? And, and I says, well, why? I mean, there's, you know, some, some of the most important books in my discipline were written in the 19th century. Are you going to get rid of Durkheim and Weber, uh, Marx even? Are you just going to trash all those things? And the answer was, the problem with the old books is that they, ha they often use inappropriate language, <laughs> right? They often offend and, and, have, and promote outdated ideas. And I, my only answer was that on balance, what you call outdated ideas is are far more subtle, far more nuanced than what you call these very, very new ideas. But the very fact that they're getting rid of outdated books and outdated ideas should warn us, because that's a prelude to the burning of books. If you get rid of books from a library, how long before they start burning books? So, yes, so that's really what I wanted to say. And I think that, for me, a couple of things uh, come out of this. Number one, we have got to fight back by ensuring that we have the values and the insights that are truly inspiring to the young. We've already lost four generations of young people. That's the truth. Four generations of young people have been lost by this education system. If you lose another generation, then we are going to be lost because it will create a situation where their anti-intellectual, their anti-educational, their anti-civilizational norms beco will become the norm and will become even more of an outsider. So we, gotta, we have no choice but to fight back against it. And that means we have got to be more courageous, much more courageous in developing and promoting our ideas. We have got to learn not to be complacent, right? We haven't got all the answers yet because we're lazy intellectually. We're really living off the past far too much instead of ensuring that our ideals are sound and clear and are able to, you know, in a sense, uh, make an impact on the 20th cent century, 21st century. Essentially, what we need is a conservative renaissance. Right? A renaissance in its proper sense. <laughs> Both the rebirth of our ideas, but also ideas that can yield to new experience. You know, one question I get asked, I'm sure that you've been asked that question as well, which is the, the, um, the typical question I get asked is, Frank, when is it going to be the end of woke? You know, when is all this idiotic stuff about gender and man having, you know, sort of uh, breasts and, get, and being pregnant? I mean, 20% of university students in Britain think that man can give birth, right? right. I mean, 40% of students think that women can have penises. I mean, where do these, you know, sort of anti-civilizational things come from? When is it going to come to an end? And my answer always is this. Wokeism is not going to come to an end by itself. It's not going to burn itself out. We're not going to get up one morning when wokeism is no longer there. Wokeism is only going to come to an end where people like you and me and everybody else in this room fight to defeat it. But we have got to understand that we're in a, a, a struggle of civilizational propor uh, proportion. The difference between the old left and the old right is much, much smaller than the difference between ourselves and these anti-civilizational people who are bringing the culture war to children, essentially. So nothing is going to end until we decide to fight back. Don't wait for it to end, but instead, you know, get organized, mobilize, 
and have the courage of your conviction. And every time you hear something that offends our sensibilities, we need to fight back and make our position very, very clear. Thank you. Damn, Frank, you're a tough act to follow. <laughs> Whose idea was putting me after Frank? <laughs> Hello again. So it's a pleasure, firstly, to be back at Nostos. I loved the conference last year. I'm very, very, very pleased to have been invited back this year um, as a speaker. Uh, I know that some of you were in London earlier this week at the National Conservative Conference with us. Sorry for fiddling with this, it's in my eye line. So I thought, um, as some of you were there with us, it might be fun and interesting to give a little bit of a twist on my NatCon speech, um, but within the context of education. And it segues quite nicely um, from what Frank said there about um, the, the way that um, particular progressives are bringing the fight to the front line um, of children, particularly young children, I think, in primary education. And so, um, for anyone that wasn't there at the NatCon speech and wants to see the background of the remarks that I'm about to make here, um, that speech is, is online, so if, if you're interested, you can, you can have a look at that later. So I'm going to use this uh, quote from Sir Roger Scruton as my springboard um, for my comments. He said, the old way of teaching the humanities was in that manner, as objects of love. This is what I have loved, what previous generations have loved too and handed on to me. Here, try it out and you will love it too. Whereas the postmodern curriculum is a curriculum of hatred, it's directed against our cultural inheritance. One after another, the works are paraded before us, stripped naked and thrashed. So there are two types of education. There is the curriculum of hatred and the curriculum of love. And as I can't look at the latter without briefly exploring the former with you, um, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And a caveat, of course, this is going to be UK focused because obviously I'm from the UK and I have no doubt though that you'll all be very familiar with a lot of what I'm going to describe here. And if you're not, then I'm very sorry to say it's coming for you. It really is. So the education of hatred, a quick whistle stop sketch of what that looks like. Sir Francis Drake, national hero in the UK, circumnavigated the globe and saved us from the Spanish Armada. He's now persona non grata, a primary school, renamed itself um, because of his links to the slave trade. Cecil Rhodes, not a national hero, but a perfect illustration of how real history doesn't actually matter, facts don't matter, because Rhodes Primary School was also renamed, even though it wasn't named after that Rhodes, it was named after a different Rhodes. Rudyard Kipling, a national icon, a house at a fee-paying school in Oxford was renamed, um, it had previously been, re uh, been named after his poem Gunga Din, and that was renamed because the poem was said to have racist connotations, something that the old boys of the school rightly, I think, described as obliterating the past. At another school, houses were renamed after J.K. Rowling and Churchill. Uh, they were renamed to the footballer Marcus Rashford, and Mary Seacole, who was a, um, a black British nurse, and this was apparently to boost diversity, which I think, can imagine from the perspective of some of my black British friends, they would find that pretty offensive. And then, of course, you have the decolonization of libraries and curriculums, trigger warnings put on Shakespeare, reading lists altered. Now, the government's counter-extremism program listed books that they thought indicative of far-right sympathies. These included Shakespeare, the television program, The Thick of It, Lord of the Rings, Brave New World, G.K. Chesterton's poems, and I kid you not, 1984 by Orwell. <laughs> now, children's books are a biggie. Uh, they're being edited left, right, and center. We recently just saw The Treasure of Roald Dahl, his book Matilda, being edited, and one of the edits they made was to replace references to Joseph Conrad, and again, Rudyard Kipling, such a baddie, um, were replaced with Jane Austen and John Steinbeck, who are apparently more appropriate for children. 
But they're also being written apace, these children's books. And I was doing some research recently for an article I was writing about modern art, and I took a, a, a trip to the Tate Modern. And here's, here's a list of some of the, the children's books, and there were a lot of children's books um, that were in the bookshop, uh, the gift shop at the Tate Modern. Self-Care in Underwear, Courage Out Loud, 25 Poems of Power, We Need to Talk About Vaginas, something I never thought I was going to say at this conference, <laughs> or any conference. Little Feminist, The Boy with Flowers in His Hair, Julian the Mermaid, Here and Queer, The Hips of the Drag Queen Go Swish, 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 <laughs> and Rainbow History Class, Your Guide Through Queer and Trans History. A report found that more than half of children's books were being, uh, half of children, children in school, sorry, um, were being taught about white privilege and unconscious bias. At Eton, the headmaster is now so woke he's been nicknamed Trendy Hendy. Radical third parties have, uh, I would say, huge and disproportionate influence on our curriculum, introducing these contested ideologies into schools. And so now we've ended up with this strange situation where Rudyard Kipling is considered inappropriate for children, but scantily clad drag queens and sexually ex explicit discussions are considered appropriate. So recently, a think tank called the New Social Covenant Unit, uh, along with some MPs, presented a, an 130-page dossier of evidence to the Prime Minister showing, that, uh, showing evidence of sexually explicit teaching resources indoctrination taking place in schools, material that MPs feared was contributing to the rise in children seeking medical transition, gender fluidity, unscientific ideological language, and in one case, a drag queen telling 11-year-olds that there are 73 genders. Primary school children, according to this report, uh, were being taught about masturbation. 12-year-olds 12, 12 were being asked what they feel, about oral se and anal sex, children being taught about dangerous and extreme sex acts and encouraged to share intimate details about sexual desires with classmates and teachers. So we need to save children, safeguard children apparently from their history, but not from this. Oakeshott said that ideology can be taught best to those whose minds are empty. And if it is to be taught to one who already believes in something, the first step of the teacher must be to administer a purge. And that's what this looks a little bit like, doesn't it? So that is the education of repudiation. That's the education of hatred, where things are brought out, stripped naked and thrashed. So what then is the education of love? Nostos, homecoming. Forgive me for briefly going a little bit Jordan Peterson on, on you. Um, but in Greek mythology, the hero crosses the sea across the primordial waters of chaos, the place above which the spirit of God breathes upon the face of the earth in Genesis 1. A place full of monsters whose darkest corners are less explored than our own solar system, even though they're closer to us. They're all the more threatening. The entropy, chaos, traversed safely, leads to the reward of the safe shores of home. Sir Roger Scruton said, we are needy creatures and our greatest need is for home. The place where we are, the place where we find protection and love. He went on to say, and this is a long quote, so bear with me. We can wander through this world alienated, resentful, full of suspicion and distrust. Or we can find our home here, coming to rest in harmony with others and with ourselves. The experience of beauty guides us along this path. It tells us that we are home in the world, that the world is already ordered in our perceptions as a place fit for the lives of beings like us. An education of love, I believe, provides the tools to navigate those primordial waters, to retrieve us from that alienation and bring us home. I mentioned in my NatCon speech, the psychiatrist Ian McGilchrist and his, his comments about music. He said that even though music is just notes and notes are nothing, that 30,000 nothings make up Bach's B minor mass. Relationships are primary 
And that's the point. It's the relationships that produce beauty. And it's through relationships that things become what they are by the relationships that they stand in. And I think that this is true also of culture, society, and a people over time. So it's too much to go into now, so I will refer you to my NatCon speech instead. But in the context of education, I believe that an education of love, a truly good education, is the cultural equivalent of a good musical education. It restores those relationships between past, present, and future. It restores harmony over dissonance within society. Through teaching young people what has been loved, and how to love. Importantly, by teaching them the truth, that they don't exist in some abstract present, that all of history and their place in it cannot be encapsulated within a rationalist, reductive, abstract ideology of repudiation. Oakeshott himself made the point that practical education is superior to a technical one. So in light of that, I will briefly finish with a plug that I have not had authorized by the organizers of this conference. conference. So I will be briefly finish by mentioning that the Common Sense Society's Caledonia Fellowship application deadline has been extended solely for the purpose of this conference so that anybody who's here can apply for it so that I don't have to tell you what an education of love looks like. You can experience it for yourself firsthand. So please, Speak to me afterwards, have a look on the Common Sense Society website to take a look at what those fellowships entail. Please apply if it's something that interests you, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yes, hello, everybody. <coughs> it's great honor, really, to be here. and. Uh, to have this uh, speech for you. Uh, of course, after these two excellent and very, very uh, stimulating speeches, it's, it's a bit difficult to, to continue because of, of course, because of my language, which is uh, uh, Finnish and not English, so I, ca I can't make that kind of eloquent uh, remarks as we have heard here. But uh, my, uh, I used to be a uh, social scientist uh, a professor of, of social work and so, uh, professor in, 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 in social sciences, but now I'm more or less a student of this renaissance of, of conservatism here as, as a retired person and uh, chairing the, uh, our, our association, Finnish culture and identity. Because of my language uh, unskills, I, I will stick to my, my written speech in order to get it done. Probably. Uh, liberalism's uh, anti-culture and uh, classical Finnish literature. <coughs> All Western countries suffer a cultural, social, and political crisis. Patrick Dinan has displayed this crisis by po pointing out in his book uh, Why Liberalism Failed that liberalism has resulted in emptying the middle ground between individual and the state by a kind of pincer movement from left and right. Classical liberalism fights for individual freedom and market economy, whereas progressive liberalism relies on the state to secu secure human rights and social justice. Liberalism has been attractive because of its commitment to human freedom, liberty. Most importantly, it has proven its ab ability to produce prosperity and relative political stability <coughs> and foster individual liberty. <coughs> it seems, however, however that it, this is now uh, over. The word libertas <coughs> is, as we, as we know, of ancient origin, and its defense and realiza realization were primary goals of political philosophy in ancient Greece and Rome, focusing on how to constrain the impulse to tyranny. 
Greek philosophy regarded self-government as a continuity from the individual to the polity and stressed education in virtue as primary. Liberty was thus thought to involve both training in discipline and self-limitation of desires and social and political arrangements supporting the virtues of temperance, wisdom, moderation and justice. According to Patrick Denen, liberal regime is constituted not only by the legal and political arrangements, but also by, by fo- foundational anthropological assumptions, namely individualism with a voluntarist conception of choice and uh, human separation from and opposition to nature. This meant a profound departure from previous ancient, ancient and Christian notions of freedom. Liberalism based thus politics upon the idea of the autonomous choice of individuals who did not have any self-restraint born of mutual concern. Human beings are thus by, na- thus by nature non-relational creatures, separate and autonomous. The legitimacy of all human relationships, family relationships included, become, be, becomes dependent on whether uh, they have been chosen on the basis of self-interest. Because of this state is created to restrain the actions of individuals and guarantee order by legal restrictions. Liberalism began with the assertion that it merely describes our decision-making, but in fact people were educated to think differently about themselves and their relationships. Liberalism teaches people to hedge commitments and adopt flexible relationships. Our relationships to place, neighborhood, nation, family and religion are seen as fungible and subject to constant uh, redefinition. The The dual expansion of state and personal autonomy rests extensively on the gradual loss of particular cultures and their replacement by a pervasive anti-culture. This new anti-culture rests on an experience of time as a pastless present and on a relationship to place as fungible and without definitional, definitional meaning. My, my claim is that our current crisis of liberalism makes uh, Alexis Kivis' novel Se- Seven Bro- Brothers more and more timely. This is a Finnish uh, classic of literature. The importance of, of uh, the novel's message of homecoming and oikophilia, oikophilia love in scrutinian sense, grows day by day, I would say. Seven Brothers is an important part of the Finnish canon of literature published in 1870. The book provided wisdom of life and beauty for a common man at least until the first half of the previous century. That experience, uh, if somewhat outdated, was still echoed in translator Richard Imbola's foreword to the English edition in 1991, when he wrote, It is a threefold labor of love on Kivi's part. Love of his land, love of his people, and love of his language. The book was handsomely uh, celebrated in 2020, but it felt somewhat uh, ceremonial because when asked, the most prominent Finnish scholars of literature 
did not mention any lecture or lesson the book could teach us today. Seven Brothers is, how, however, a timely work of art because it deals with the sphere between individual and state, neglect, neglected by liberalism. The brother's story of life does not fit well into liberalism's standards, but if ro properly studied, it uncovers things which are still profoundly and highly relevant. Freedom is understood today as doing what each of us pleases to do. There is that kind of individualistic freedom in the beginning of this novel as the brothers established their living in the forest apart from their community. The story comes to an end, however, as they return to their place of origin and thus take their place in the long chain of past generations. The novel shows an, an, an encounter between the old and liberal concept of freedom and transcends liberal freedom. Uh, we don't, don't know what the world order will be after 10 or 20 years uh, time, but it seems that we must take classical assumptions about uh, human nature seriously. We are not simply rootless cosmopolitans without a need for home and a nation, without love. Love requires a readiness to make a sacrifice and a sense of sacred, because, as Roger Scruton writes, without the sa sacred, man lives in a depersonalized world, a world where all is permitted and where nothing has absolute value. Thank you. It's been uh, delightful to, uh, to be here and uh, talk with so many of you. Last night I had the pleasure of uh, meeting another person who's been through the purchase, in a sense, uh, but more seriously than myself. And, uh, and we talked about carrying the torch. And uh, it's like Frank said, it's kind of hard to tackle things such as in academia, head on and uh, uh, not be, have that togetherness of working together. And, uh, and that's something I'd like to address a little bit because uh, like with, with our talk last night, it happened a while, ago, uh, a while ago, but we're still bleeding from it. But none of us would have been without it because uh, we've learned so much about it. And, and I really love, uh, nice quote at the end there, I really love everything you said here. And um, the educational love, that sounds good. And I'm only saying this because I want to say uh, the word love in my, uh, in my talk also, so that I have that. Because last night I also heard uh, Poem Invictus by uh, William Ernest Henley. And um, it made me think about resilience and inner strength, but also optimism. And I would like to share with you uh, uh, a bit of my uh, experience with cancel culture and, uh, and uh, academic freedom, which uh, has to do with uh, wokeness and uh, inclusion, sorry to say that word, and how fear influences academics at the highest levels in Norwegian universities. And this burden, it has taught me that uh, you would have to be crazy, crazy submissive, submissive or insane to enter academia in Norway. 
But I am a uh, historian and I, I prefer to see beyond mere personal stories and, uh, and in broader perspectives. So I've decided to make a more positive statement because I do remain optimistic. And I, I will start with wokeness, the kind of wokeness that I've experienced in, in academia. Because on that part, not all the wokeness that you mentioned, Emma, you kind of destroyed my argument here. <laughs> but I do think that wokeness, in a sense, is a good thing. Because it makes more of us. All right? And it unites us. And because many don't fit in anymore, and the lunacy and the fear in academia have gotten quite transparent now, I shall say. And now it's easier for people to spot the madness. This uh, square which wokeness seemed to want us to fit into has gotten so small that uh, their adversaries are, in fact, destroying their own hegemonies. And the only thing we need to do is not fall into their traps of living up to their hostile portrayals of you as perceived enemies, because we are not, right? Napoleon famously said, don't disturb the enemy while he's making a mistake. And, and, and I say, sit tight. Let's meet like we do here, and let's talk together more and more. Let's embrace humanism and uh, human values and, and rights like free speech. And in not too long, we won't be the crazy ones anymore. I hope. <laughs> because the tide is definitely turning. And, uh, and mind you, there will be acts, and in fact there are acts, of desperation towards us from those who can't stand losing the grip they felt they had on society, on liberty, and on the silent majority. And there are many ways the world can go from here, and it's definitely easier to tear down than to build up. But here in the North, we're united and strong for the first time in centuries, actually, and that's a good thing. And to use conservative politicians who are here, you have a unique opportunity now to embrace regionalism instead of globalism. Because there's a potential there. As uh, Hannes uh, Gissurarsson, oh, I'm sorry, my Icelandic is not good enough. Hannes Gissurarsson, right? I yeah, hope that was good enough. Talked about in his talk. My personal experiences in the past five years have taught me much about strength and the importance of courage, as opposed to succumbing to fear and weakness. Strength and courage works because it's good in the long run, and we're in for the long run, right? And we can find unity in wisdom, in knowledge of our common past, our ancestors and shared history. And let's leave the minor strides aside and unite in solidarity against the craziness. And we need to stop bullshitting. No nonsense. Let's not focus on negative drivers. Let's not feed or give in to those who undermine, who seek to divide and conquer, demoralize and dehumanize who wrongfully try to guilt trap our minds for trials and errors in the past because they only hope to push us into extremities when they're the ones who are acting in extreme ways. So I say wokeness is a good thing because it makes more of us. It unites us and if this continues, even more will see the madness and we choose to prefer us to them, 
like in the recent elections here in Finland. Thank you. Well, as you can see from the program, coffee is coming soon. So stick with us just for a little moment. <laughs> it was such so engaging, so thrilling to listen to you. I I I, I couldn't I can interrupt. But uh, listening to you all, I'm reminded of a quote from uh, G. K. Chesterton, who said that. Education is simply the soul of a society as it passes from one generation to another. Well, this begs the question, how do we transmit the accumulated wisdom of our forefathers to our posterity in an age of relativism and multiculturalism? Frank? <laughs> Keep it brief. Uh, and we'll uh, maybe have more questions yeah, that well, we can answer. I'll be very brief. Read my book, A Hundred Years of Identity Crisis, The Culture War Over Socialization, where I explain that this is the problem of our time. We're not transmitting it now, but we could. Interesting. Well, can, may I come in yeah. on that quickly? Um, I th I, going back to... Um, uh, the panel earlier this morning, um, the briefly, um, the discussion about families. I think, for obvious reasons, a lot of our attention when it comes to transmitting knowledge and culture focuses on the educational system. But fundamentally, also what we're seeing in parallel to everything that's just been described is the, the breakdown of parental rights. Um, and I think fundamentally, the transmission of culture is something that has to happen in the home. So if it's a very conservative idea that if you want to have strong societies you ha and strong cultures, you have to have strong families as well. So that's something that is outside of the education system, outside of the academy, that each and every one of us can be doing, which is raising good, solid children and making sure that they have a good sound understanding of their place in time and history and who they are. Um, that is, and also, of course, um, parallel to that, you have to fight for parental rights because one of the problems with what I was just describing there is that in the United Kingdom, that is something that's gradually being eroded. So parents have less of a right to take their children out of section, sex and relationship education, as one example. And, and I say, I say we don't. To answer your question, and and parental, yeah, uh, outside of academia <laughs> is, is my personal experience and there are so many people talking outside of and meeting outside of academia and, and uh, parental, yeah, but parental duty more or less because in my country we live in a uh, country where people are so indebted that they have no choice but work so much that people break up their marriages almost everyone in their 30s now because they don't have time, there's too much friction and you leave the upbringing of your children to the state. And that don't go so well, actually. <laughs> so, so, so as a parent myself, it's, it's, it's hopeless to see uh, because, uh, I mean, we, we don't want to go there maybe and talk why it's become this way. But, uh, but sure, I think, Emma, you think you're onto something there. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a very short uh, answer. I, I think that uh, we should uh, really uh, think and begin to discuss what are the cornerstones of our uh, civilization and uh, and our uh, culture, and really try to keep those and try to push back this invasion of uh, of, of irrationality. Invasion is a good word. <laughs> yeah, speaking of irrationality, postmodernism. Uh, the very purpose of uh, academic freedom is to pursue truth, but postmodernism seems to be undermining that whole uh, pursuit. How do we as conservatives face this challenge? Well, I think the problem is not postmodernism, 
but when we are reluctant to acknowledge or struggle to em engage in this journey for the truth. And I think that uh, this is where the, it's the biggest disappointment for me. Everybody points their fingers at postmodernism. They make jokes about it. Ho, 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 ho. But what are we doing to give meaning to truth in such a way that everyday people in our lives, in our world, have something to grasp? We have to give voice to people. That's our job. And the only way we can do that is if we give truth meaning instead of worrying about the postmodernists, because nobody can understand them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Not even the postmodernists. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, I, I, I'll follow up you there, Frank, because I totally agree. Uh, this thing with truth, as a historian, this is something that comes and goes every 20 years or so, or, or, or sometimes more. And we've seen it, people battle. And, and the, the term is, what is truth? When Joe Biden made his inauguration speech, he said, now we will fight for truth. And, and that's kind of scary to hear a president says that, say that, because then the next question is, what is truth then? And is it all relative? Or, or, or can you choose the truth you want to do in these times? Uh, or like in the Norwegian school system, <laughs> truth is how you feel. It's not how someone is saying something. And, and it's, uh, it, it makes the teachers, uh, they don't have, uh, well, they don't have any truth, <laughs> basically. Um, just to add to that as well, I think um, John Stuart Mill made the point about free speech that it's necessary in order to correct error. And I think if we acknowledge particularly a sort of Christian anthropology that we're all fallen, fallible creatures who make mistakes, we know that it's not just the postmodernists who make mistakes, we all in this room will make errors of, of judgment at various points and, and think things that turn out to be untrue and are bad ideas and have possibly unintended consequences. Um, but I, and I, d I assume that this is probably the case also in Scandinavian countries, or at least in the UK, this is not a problem of the people. This is a problem of the liberal metropolitan elite and the academy and those people who are sent into our institutions from the academy because we have an over uh, uh, an overeducated populace. I don't mean that in the literal sense. I mean lots of people are going to university where they're encountering these ideas and then they take them with them into running our institutions and therefore the ecosystem that makes up the sort of upper echelons of our society. But actually outside of the urban centers. This isn't what people think. This isn't how people think. Um, and so it's not just about academic freedom. It's also about freedom of speech that if you fight for people's freedom to say what they believe to be true, then the truth will eventually win out because it's it's part of a the self-correcting you know, process of our society that we should be able to critically engage with ideas. This is why, you know, when we talk about having a curriculum of love, that doesn't mean that you're uncritical of your past. We know that all of our countries have done rotten things in the past. They've also done many great things. But the only way that you can actually have f fruitful, fertile discussions about these things and to move forward in a conservative manner, to progress in a conservative manner, is to be able to do so freely and to be able to have free discussions like we're having today. Uh, Emma, when you talk about this, do you, do you, do you think, uh, uh, because you're talking about trial and error, and, and all of European history is a history of trial and error, right? And do you think it's more like many people feel that now we shouldn't error at all? Is that sort I of like think, the basis? I think people have come to believe that they're at the end of history. Right. And that's the problem. People have for too long thought that they've arrived at the destination it's because not, they, they view problem. themselves outside of history rather than as part of it. It's not a problem in, in, in uh, Viking Age uh, Scandinavia because the end of history after Ragnarok, <laughs> we, we, we rebuilt society. <laughs> and that is why you're all going to lead us to the conservative renaissance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but perhaps due to like uh, you go to a conservative conference like this and you listen to conservative pundits on the internet and you know you hear over and over again that academia has been captured by the left and as a result of that a lot of conservatives are opting out of uh, higher education and uh, they take more 
manual labor, perhaps, or something that isn't as ridden by wokeism. Uh, and they don't want to go into the path of, uh, you know, going into the university to be, become a resistance there. But how, how do we encourage people, uh, people that uh, are fit for uh, higher education, but due to the wokeness that they perceive is dominating this university, uh, that they opt out? What do we tell them? Well, I, I think you've got to tell them you have no choice. But we, we have to conquer higher education. If you lose our cultural institutions entirely, then we become bereft of the support that we need to make our ways. And despite what you hear, and it is horrible in academia if you're an open conservative. I mean, they give you a hard time. I was for Brexit, and I was the only, there was two of us in the university who were professors for Brexit. I went into the senior common room, and they looked at you like Dracula. You know, <laughs> Ferradi has come in, and everybody puts a cross up, you know, sort of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of try to keep you out. But I can only tell you my own story. I've, over the years, I've had over 50 PhD students who I've supervised, and they became doctors. About 40 of them are now academics. 10 of them are in politics, in public life. They're all doing really well. And that's just because of the influence of one one kind of Maldi academic. Imagine if there were many of us doing that. That shows and just how dangerous you are, right? I don't know. That's I'm why I couldn't get a job. I, I'm, <laughs> a, I'm a lovely guy. Everybody <laughs> knows me. But I, I'm serious. We have to reconquer the universities. That's, n that's not an option. We can't have a conservative renaissance without there being a conservative intelligentsia. Right? You need to have a conservative intelligence in some shape or form. I, I, yeah. Yes, I, I totally agree with Frank, uh, but uh, 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 just one kind of point of, of view here is that uh, uh, maybe it is that uh, more and more intellectual work is done outside university nowadays, so mm. that there is a very keen interest in, in philosophy and things like that, and uh, irrespective of the all, all the harmful effects of this internet, so there is also very much uh, uh, very uh, meaningful, important, uh, uh, profound uh, uh, lectures and discussions going on. So that by might be a kind of uh, means to also uh, push the academics. Yeah. I mean, I run an organization called MCC Brussels, and I'm always looking for smart people who are uh, interested in scholarship. So if any of you want a career uh, and fight the culture wars in a very serious level, contact me afterwards, if you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I have to say that um, it's a little bit awkward, my old university. Uh, in my old university, there, there are, I saw the news here the other day that uh, they're, they're running a master's degree just to do office work. And, and there's this inflation at the same time of master's degrees and PhDs, um, which is, it's, it's almost like they're destroying it for themselves, you know. And, and, and uh, I was thinking until I met you, Frank, that maybe we shouldn't fight it and just uh, if we meet a person like that, yeah, sure, let's meet and let's talk, but not inside of academia. But if it's possible to do the fight, I'm all in. Yeah, good. Uh, Emma, and then we have to... Wrap up with one tiny question. Oh, okay. The lords of time have spoken. Maybe yes. very, very brief. Very, very brief to follow on from what you were saying. Um, I think I mentioned Oakshot's preference for practical over technical wisdom. Um, and I think that we have seen an inflation of university qualifications, and at least it's certainly the case in the UK. I think that we shouldn't be diminishing the value in our society of non-academic career paths. I think that we should have more apprenticeships. In the UK, we've just had a policy announced that's going to allow people to 
become doctors through apprenticeship rather than going to medical school same standards but through apprenticeship the same with nurses there's no reason why police officers should have to go to university all it does is expose them to all of these ideas and put them into lots of debt and delay them settling down having families buying a home so actually i think that apprenticeships are a very conservative idea i think that we should be encouraging people and encouraging society to value these quote, normal jobs that don't require university degrees and actually to be pushing for more career paths to not require university degrees because it's not necessary. Well, I would like to say a huge thanks to all the panelists and uh, to you, uh, the audience, uh, for bearing with us, going a bit over the time, but now, you will get your precious coffee. <laughs> yes. Yeah.